starting subaltern so voice of the subaltern in introduction this is a very important question for the university exam in a celebrated essay can the subaltern speak this the said that gayatri chakravarti spy work points out the ability and the inability of the subaltern to speak about the issues in their voices kamala dasu's poem is also the voice of the subaltern who are the subaltern here the subaltern are the women especially indian women kamala das becomes a spokesperson well almost for this chapter's gender that is women kamala das sets out to consciously and unconsciously bring out the voice of the women in general she instead of using the inclusive pronoun we uses the singular i throughout the poem which makes her attempt everybody she talks about her personal experience however her experience can be regarded as a signifier of the experience of all women the poetic ignorance of politics shows the perceived general ignorance of women about politics however like any other educated woman she knows those who rule the country this ignorance is however a posture which negates the importance of politics in the lives of the women where a greater system of the gender politics is at play here the gender means male politics gender can be both male and female so the names of the politicians are remembered as names of the months are which shows the futility of the nomenclature very early in the poem das introduces herself as an indian who is very brown a woman in india should not have a brown complexion which disqualifies her from the prospect of a good marriage since fairness is equated with beauty in our society women in india were not supposed to be educated and even if by mistake they must write and if they write they must write in english kamala das is educated she is writing and that too in english she has to face many problems because of this she is criticized by critics friends and even cousins this choice of language shows the rebellious voice of women who choose the path contrary to what the society has designed that is what is the problem with us the kamala das refers her choice of a language to be natural to her as roaring to lions and coin to crows she has mentioned these lines in the poem kamala das here is for us talking about the concept of a creature feminine developed by feminist criticism where the feminists try to create a system of language that will suit a woman writer so according to helen six six years c i x o u s who coined the term a creature feminine she was a woman who used the term a creature feminine is a system of writing where the imaginary system of language is used rather than the symbolic both the terms are used in reference to jake lacans three orders you all have not studied jake lacans but other universities have done so imaginary is symbolic and real jake lacans three orders the imaginary stage is the pre linguistic stage of the human development where the restrictive norms of the language do not operate hence the woman should be should debunk the way of male writing and adopt the female female way of writing kamala das negates the taboo related to the description of a woman's pubic hair and a sexual maturity and openly talks about these issues in the poem kamala das also talks about the problem of marriage the woman in india is supposed to get married early otherwise they might be considered as either bad woman or woman with defect for that reason they do not get married early 
So marrying at an early age creates a lot of problem for the young lady whose mind is not prepared for the responsibilities of neither family nor sexuality forced sexual relations destroy the body and the mind of the woman. So the bitter sexual experience of marriage made Kamala Dash hate herself and her femininity. She thought that if she could manage, change her gender or her appearance, then she might not be subjected to further humiliations. This is the lowest point of Kamala Dash's personality, which shows the amount of intense pressure on women. So even in these roles, she is not acceptable. The society wants her to be a proper woman who wears saris and ornaments and quarrels with the husband, servants. The this desire for the identity on the part of the society comes from the threat that the truant woman poses to establish to the established order of the society, and then she can claim herself to be a real woman. Kamala Dash also points out the basic desire of all women, incidentally, of all human beings, love, which leads them into many betrayals, making them vulnerable to either patriarchal restrictive protect, protectivism, protectivism or a life of constant threat of unrootedness. Thus, we see how in the poem the poet is right writes of almost about all the maladies that plague the women in our society. And the protest and resistance is there in the very description of the problem. So you see, here the topic was voice of the subaltern. Now, this topic is the voice of those women who are subaltern means rather lowly placed, rather lowly placed in the society than men. So naturally, this question will arise. What that, what Gaiti Spivak has said, can the subaltern speak? Of course they can speak. They know how to speak, but the question is not speaking. But the question is that whether you are able to protest what you feel you should protest. What you feel you should protest. If you do not have the, have the ability to protest, naturally, you will not be acceptable to the society. That means the woman is unable to protest. Means what? That the woman is unable to say anything which is which goes against them. So you see, Kamala Dash does not belong to this category of woman. She would like to say what she feels is true. And whatever she says may not be acceptable. The society might not accept it. The society might say that, no, we cannot accept the woman in a male-dominated society speaking against norms which are not admissible to society. That is wrong. That is the wrong approach you should say. At times, it is a, taken in that manner. It's a very wrong approach. When you talk in that manner when you say that women have got nothing to say. Why women will have nothing to say? What is the reason behind it? What is the fault with them? What is it that made them so susceptible to the change? Why won't they be able to say anything? So these questions will always arise. Why won't women say? They have every right to say. So, you see, we still live in a tabooed society. And this tabooed society is such a society that where 
you are not able to say anything because you are not allowed to say it. Some way or the other, you are prevented from saying it. And so it is a taboo society. Hey. So it is a taboo society. Now, in this respect, if this is what I have said to you, other things are also to be explained in Kamala Das's poems. Now I'm going to discuss about the imagery in the poem. Imagery in the poem. And this I'm going to continue now. Because this is very, very important to know. The imagery in the poem. Most of us, we try to avoid this imagery, imagery which is very much prominent in the poem and tells us that where we are going wrong. But Kamala Das has made this imagery also very simple for us. So Kamala Das's writing is full of sensuous phenomena which always retain a sensory quality are realistic and direct. It is connected to the empirical reality of the situation described as it presents emotions and subjective reactions with descriptions which seem to come from a distant third person view. That is why emotions seem to be an inherent part of the reality. They are as real and concrete as any physical object can be. Reality embraces emotions and medium-sized dry objects alike. Dash often manages to form this sort of unity of inner and outer events. It is very important to understand the imagery to understand the poem. Kamala Das does it very efficiently. I felt as if nothing of what I saw or heard or were to be wasted. It was as if someone had asked me to be a tonic player for the times I lived in. I walked around for hungry, for sights and sensations. This passion for a talking in the world of senses is evident in Kamala Das's poetry and constitutes one of its most appealing qualities. A famous critic, Anishu Rahman, also proposes to understand Kamala Das's imagery in a phenom phenom phenomenological way. Phenomenological way. Kamala Das is one much such poet who recognizes the orbit, especially in regard to creating emotional analogs and drawing her imagery from the vast reserve of personal memories. She uses them as exclusive medium of transcendence, as means of creating experimental credibility. Poetry, insofar as it records internal tremors, is like a seismograph. That is, seismo, where does the word seismograph come from? Seismology. That is the movement of the earth crust, earthquake. Her poetry is like that movement of the earthquake. But much more than this, it objectifies the passions and confers meaning on experience, which tends to become universal. Thus, a phenom phenomenological approach is the best way to tackle Tasha's imagery in order to respect the unity of appreciation. And it is true that sometimes we do not we do not, what do, I should say, appreciate a woman writing poem. Why? Because we think that women should remain as they are. And they should not own up what they feel like. So this is a very bad way of accepting women. Why should we degrade women? What reason makes us degrade them? So the unity of inner and outer events in Dash's images 
ought to be understood with care and proper aptitude. The result from the formal analysis made in the previous section are important in order to determine the weight of each image in its context. Although all images in Dash's poems are interesting, only those which di directly articulate traits of a personal identity will be considered here. She said, I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days or weeks or names or months, beginning with Nehru. As was mentioned before, the lines one and two have a monotonic space and timbre, and this reflects the speaker's attitude towards politics. She has nowhere said that she hates politics, but there is still a distinction between politics and power. Power of spaces and these spaces have become names. It does not matter what policy they stand for, but it is useful to know their names. And that is it what it is. As it is useful to be able to name the days and months. This feeling about politics has its roots in the importance of Gandhi for Kamala Dasha's father. The Gandhi image, the message, a strong influence on her father was equally important in those who lived in Nala Pet House. Kamala, reacting as a child, found the Gandhian principles too Spartan to be attractive. She was convinced that Gandhiji was a killjoy. It was only many years later that she was able to assess him more objectively and realistically. The feeling about Gandhiji might have tainted Dasha's attitude towards Nehru too. And that is why he seems to be nothing more than the first name in a series of names. As Monday is the first in the series of weekdays, having mentioned Nehru, as stated in the previous section, the tone of the poem changes and Nehru functions as a past pro toto expression. All the names which are important in politics they belong into one single basket and that is to be understood very well what she wants to say which can be labeled with Nehru and that has nothing to do with the person to be introduced in the poem so denying that politics has nothing to do with how Kamala Das, an Indian poet writing at a time when political turbulences in India were of utmost importance sees herself is a very strong statement. It can also be mentioned in a very way, in various ways. And there are critics who like to interpret it in their own way. Rahman or Nair or Nabar were able to trace the importance of these first lines was the theme of the whole poem. I speak three languages, writing two, dream in one. This suggests that dreaming is a kind of speech. It is a language of thought, as Jerry Fowler calls it. Just as Kamala, the poet, seeing herself as a chronicler, that means the history maker of the times, when writing poetry articulates sights and sensations, the phenomenon of the world using English and Malayalam, Kamala's dream seems to be an articulation too. But an articulation does not mean that she is saying something. It is of her emotions or of her mind. Why is a dream something else than a poem? Why do the other two languages not suffice? The reason is simple. Dreaming is closer to sights and sensations than written English. It contains epistemic, epistemically private meanings which can't be communicated straight away. A dream can be understood but not in the same way as a sentence in English can be understood. And both are different from understanding a sentence in Malayalam. Dreaming is subject to Malayalam and English are intersubjective. That is why only the last two can be written. So she goes on to say, it is useful to me as cawing is to crow or roaring to the lions. 
it is human speech, the speech of the mind that is here and there, a mind that sees and hears and is aware of. So English is useful. It is a statement. It is an instrument as coin is an expression of the inner nature of the crow, of the crow, or as roaring in signified green lion. So it has a meaning of its own. It's nothing new. English is a means of disclosing metallies to other people. But the language of thought which is made public through writing poetry in English is something special. It is locatable in the world. It has an anchor in empirical reality. The meaning of the poetic language is not just somewhere in the world. It is exactly here and there. This is impossible if the poet was not completely aware of the phenomena surrounding her especially the visual and the oral ones. She was very sensitive to this visual and oral senses around her. It is interesting to see that no olfactory sensations or qualities of the touch and taste have found their way into the poem. So sensuousness of the touch is not there. It is as if Kamala Das only knew visual, oral and mental objects that she mentioned in the poem. Of trees in storm, or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral fire. Blazing funeral fire means where the body is cremated. The funeral pyre, when it's burning, it has a sound of its own. That sound is not conspicuous or clearly heard or seen, or clearly audible in anywhere else. Another kind of speech is introduced in these lines, the sound and the vision, the trees in the storm and of the blazing funeral pyre. The speech is deep and blind. It does not seem to bear meaning. All the poet encounters in these natural phenomena are incoherent mutterings. The line suggests that Das draws a distinction between cultural and natural phenomena. The latter do not convey any sense for the aware human. They transcend human categories. There seem to be three spheres in Dasha's world. The inner sphere of the dream, the outer sphere of the society, and the sphere of the natural world. The cosmic sphere, which a poet can only understand, which transcends human understanding. We are humans, but not poets. Weather and death are forces which can be experienced by every human. They have a certain familiarity which words in a known language also have. So at the same time, they can't be understood as words or other cultural objects they seem to signify. But they do not. This explains why these phenomena speak about without saying anything. Why their speech is deaf, blind, and nothing more than incoherent mutterings. So when she says, my sad woman body felt so beaten, the weight of my breast and womb crushed me. Then I wore a shirt and my brother's trousers, cut my hair short and ignored my womanliness. So these lines contain sensations which may have a quality which is completely clear to any woman, but completely alien to any man. It makes no sense if I try to discuss the phenomena which are for biological reasons, inaccessible to me. But similar experiences can be made in different situations. The general form is this. A person A does something to a person B, which considers to be totally normal. But B feels abused through that action, but knows that A did not injure her intentionally. And that furthermore, she is also completely unaware that that action injured person B. A person B also thinks that A, the action is normal and that A is more powerful. Anyway, she will be frustrated by the part of a personal identity, which in her eyes, they were right. Reason to act how she did. This may lead to a partial rejection of what B sees as a herself. In the case of the speaker, the point to rejection of womanhood. Although such problems, particularly often situations which have something to do with sex, the penetration of a man into a woman. 
it is already natural but if it is taken the natural way it is natural otherwise the kamla gash it is a painful experience for the first time when she did have that experience they generally occur when different standards of taste or of judgment clash without any party involved noticing that difference in with one party completely acting out its will just because it has more power man is powerful so over woman man is powerful political discussion the situations at work or at school can thus cause self denial because of established power relations and a misconceived notion of normality in the situation at hand as it had caused in kamla gash her first sexual encounter with her husband or whosoever may be her boyfriend also a discussion of power relations and the possible effects on how the speaker sees herself may clarify these lines for an approach which focuses on social relationship but this in social relationship is really natural sexual penetration is natural but nothing unnatural but allah das the experience was painful but such an approach is obviously different from a phenomenological one it applies the general idea of how power works in society to the poem it does not derive at an interpretation which stems from understanding the unity of inner and outer events which are articulated this fact will considerably weaken what can be said about how the poet articulates her aware, awareness of herself as a woman she is a woman and she has to accept the fact that will await her on the wedding night first wedding night because it does not come centralize the poet's self consciousness hegel the famous philosopher analyzed the interaction of two self conscious individuals and how dominance rules this relationship it must be questioned below if his general view can yield results for the self consciousness that she expresses in the lines about a relationship with men be girl be wife be cook that is what the impression that is carried forward to a girl who has grown across over her poverty here the expectations of a social environment are described the missing articles point out that neither a particular girl is meant as in be like the girl from the neighbor family not that being any kind of girl is meant as in be like a girl there seem to be rigid and static ideas of girl wife and cook to which the speaker is expected to adapt to after a marriage so you say below like the categorizers this image alters the image created through the categories without articles from above why is a girl wife cook a woman is everything made into one only the situation makes it demand what it is and makes it more clear the speaker social environment classifies women using a rigid scheme and they are so used to it and inflexible that any deviation cause an outburst of intolerance so this goes well together with the image from the first few lines and dashes dislike of gandhian virtues at an earlier age it also gives a reasons to doubt the usefulness of pure socio cultural or socio political considerations and to emphasize the view that a detailed analysis of form and content will tell us more about the poem as an expression of self consciousness so she says be madhava putti it's time to choose a name a role don't play pretending games so madhava putti is the pseudonym das used when she wrote in malayalam it is a constructed and due to be a more label a superficial identity it is time to choose a name a role might be the speaker's reaction to society's expectations although this is not unambiguously said it is as if the speaker intended to invent an official identity which does not really match the individual that reacts intensely to the world and expresses 
these reactions in cones, but serves, but serves to calm, but serves to calm the social environment a bit. Don't be pretending games is then an inner voice which expresses the categorizer's attitude towards such an invented identity. It is the alter ego. Alter ego that works in women. Don't play games. It might be contestable to hear two voices speak in these two lines, but if the previous image are considered a coherent interpretation, will need this addition. If one is not willing to ascribe a lack of skill or of conceptual coherence to the poet, which is based on even less evidence. Again, it is said, don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love. I met a man, loved him. Although the speakers finally met a man she loved, the person of whom she thinks that he might be able and interested in really understanding and acknowledging her innermost self, the social environment rule that the pain of a breakup should never be expressed, suggests that even in a relationship, there will be an expectation which burden the speaker. So she says in him, the hungry haste of rivers in me, the ocean style is waiting. So the lover is unable to acknowledge the speaker's innermost self. He is spiritually important and lacking deepness. As every river comes to the sea once and is absorbed, the speaker has to absorb his hungry haste in a tireless waiting. Here it is mentioned about the sexual encounter, the penetration of the man into the woman. If power relations should be important here, the speaker would not be so utterly passive. In Hegel's analysis of how two self-conscious individuals interact in the social cultural reality, the two individuals start fighting and the winner oppresses the loser. So in these lines, we find neither fighting nor oppression, the great deep ocean does not really care for the shallow hunger of one single river. So these images can be seen as expressing a deep sadness about the lover's spiritual importance. It could even be seen as conveying a hint of compassion for the lover's shallowness. Anywhere and everywhere, I see the one who calls himself, I in this world, he is tightly packed like the sword in its sheath. So the speaker starts to make general statement about everybody having a certain grasp of oneself. This gap of oneself remains unexpressed. It is highly packed like the sword of its sheath. The idea of spiritual importance is found in other people too. They seem to know that they also are self-conscious individuals, but they do not manage to express the consciousness or even to notice that it's sharp blade could thread categories in this world. The shallowness and the importance, importance are expressed with the form of these lines too. So no man wants to be important when he is in the contact with women under him. So the meter and the sounds of the sound used in these lines to undermine the content and display of Dash's poetic skills. It is I who drink lonely, drink at 12, midnight, or hotels of strange towns. It is I who laugh, it is I who make love and then feel shame. It is I who lie, die. With a rattle in my throat, I am a sinner, I am a saint, I am the beloved, I am, and I am betrayed. I have no joys which are not yours, no aches which are not yours. I too call myself I. So the speaker contrasts the contrast to the shallowness of the other people with a self-conscious view. She does the same thing as some other people do, but she experiences them more intensely. She points out that she not only knows the emotions these other people experience in their shallowness, but that she also knows most of the opposite emotions as well as the self-consciousness make it, make it possible for her to embrace opposites. So usually it so happens, and that is how the world stands. The opposites always attract each other. The opposites always are over each other. She calls herself I too, but in her case, because she is aware of what, of what I stands for in such a deeper way, this I is the spiritually important. It can express itself in poetry.
so you see how she exposes herself in what she says she is very candid she is very clear to her expression to her voice and she doesn't make it impossible for us to understand what she wants us to understand it may be that she has a way of thinking her own way but that whatever she says is nothing wrong that she says of herself she is right in whatever way she would like to call herself she doesn't want that people should take her to be something else other than that she thinks herself to be she is a woman there's no denial of the fact but she has also her identity as a woman that has to be understood very properly and the identity of hers she wants to make it very very clear she wants to say that the identity is not she alone but it is also her own self her own individuality that makes her identity so very conspicuous so that is also a question that should be understood you know it has to be understood she does not only make herself identifiable but she may want to say that if i am a woman if i have my womanly voice and my womanly feelings and my womanly way of expression i have other ways also to express express myself so that is the how way i do it and that is how i do it so we see that kamla dash is very candid about her herself she wants to say that whatever i'm saying is from my point of view it may not agree with others but that doesn't mean that i am totally wrong 